Hello, I'm Dave Snow. I'm a distinguished professor of sociology here at the university. I'm also a co-director for the Center of uh, Citizen Peace Building and uh, have served for a number of years as the faculty athletic representative on campus. Actually, in terms of significant research accomplishments, I think they cluster into two areas. Uh, one has to do with social movements and participation in social movements, and the other has to do with uh, homelessness and the research I've done on homelessness uh, throughout the country and uh, to a certain degree internationally. Let me talk first about the uh, research on social movements. I think my major contrib contribution there is twofold. Uh, early on when I first began, uh, began studying social movements, uh, I was interested in the question of uh, who participates and why. And particularly for some movements, uh, this was back in the mid-1970s uh, when there were a number of kind of offbeat religious movements in the country. Why do some people join these movements and how does the conversion process uh, occur? One, one of the uh, key findings now looking back seems relatively simple, but at that time it was fairly novel. And what I found is a key determinant for linking people to any particular movement was their social networks. Prior to that, uh, what was usually theorized uh, and anticipated was that people who joined social movements were kind of offbeat, alienated, disconnected. But what I found in my research is that wasn't necessarily the case and people were connected to others through their uh, interpersonal ties and social networks. So I examined that in a number of contexts with respect to offbeat religious movements and also with data collected. I collected on uh, students uh, across some campuses participating in social movements. But there was still the question of one can be exposed to a particular movement or stimuli if you, if you uh, want, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're going to join. I was thinking of networks more as conduits for the diffusion or flow of information. So the question was, how are the, the interests, the values, the opinions, and so forth of potential participants align with those of social movement organizations. And it, it was through investigating this question in a number of contexts that I began to develop with some of my graduate students what came to be known as the framing perspective on social movements. Uh, framing has to do, well, framing addresses the que such questions as what is going on here? What is this? What is the meaning of this? What is it an instance of? What kind of action is called for? Uh, the concept of frames has been used uh, across a number of social science disciplines, cognitive science, psychology, uh, sociology, political science. I drew primarily on the work of uh, Irving Goffman, uh, but extended it and refined it, the concept uh, in ways that he did not discuss and applied it to social movements. Let me give you an example of, uh, of a frame or framing of something. Uh, I said that uh, framing has to do with questions of what's going on, what is this? A number of years ago, you may recall, there was a award-winning documentary called The March of the Penguins. Right after that came out, there was what I would call a framing debate as to what this means. Uh, some people on the political right and on the religious right said, ah, the March of the Penguins substantiates the natural character of monogamy. Uh, some scientists said, well, it has nothing to do with that. So what you got to get into here is a framing debate between what's the meaning of this. Uh, the issue the relevance of this to social movements is it is often thought that people uh, get involved in social movements because they're aggrieved about X, Y, or Z, and that's true, but we all have grievances of different kinds, but they don't always get us involved in something. And so 
with my, some of my graduate students began to develop this, a theory that has uh, been further developed over the years, uh, providing answers to the question of why do some people get involved rather than others. So for an example, we developed this, what's called frame alignment perspective. And an, an example of that would be what an alignment mechanism is what's called frame amplification. And so all of, all of us have values and interests that are right in a hierarchy. Some are more important than others. What the framing process do, does in case of amplification is elevate some of those as being more important than others. And the significance of this, I guess, is that uh, it's, it's been a source of a lot of research, uh, primarily for students of social movements, but across different disciplines, and has uh, generated a good number of, of uh, publications by other people as a consequence. Turning to the area of, uh, of homelessness, uh, I've been studying homelessness in various ways and degrees, oh gosh, since the, uh, the mid-1980s. Uh, I think there are three things that stand out. At that point, research on the homeless was focused on their demographic characteristics and on their uh, disabilities, physical disabilities, mental disabilities, and substance-related issues. I tracked those uh, concerns, but that wasn't re my real interest. My real interest was how do homeless survive? What's the character of life on the street? So initially, along with a f uh, fellow graduate student, at this point back at the University of Texas, we did uh, an ethnographic uh, study of uh, homelessness in the streets of Austin, Texas, spending together probably 500 hours on the streets, interviewing uh, close to 200 homeless that we met, and also tracking a sample of about 800 homeless through a range of institutions in Texas. And a couple things uh, that I think are significant that came from that. One is in learning about how homeless adapt on the, uh, on the streets. They're often seen as is kind of dysfunctional, uh, maladaptive folks. But uh, our research indicates uh, they're highly adaptive uh, and resourceful in terms of finding ways to make do in a context in which there were little resources to draw on. Additionally, uh, and somewhat surprisingly, we also found that the, uh, the homeless are very, struggle uh, with issues of self, self-regard, and identity. And what's kind of interesting about that is uh, there's this famous uh, theory by uh, late psychologist Abraham Maslow uh, on the hierarchy of needs. And the argument is it's kind of a pyramid and at the bottom there's certain kind of physical, uh, food-related safety needs and issues of self identity and so forth uh, are towards the top and are not really of relevance until these other needs are tended to. And what we found in our initial research was that's not the case at all. And in subsequent research uh, where we've interviewed people in, in Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, in Tokyo, homeless people in Paris and Los Angeles and doing a comparative study and asking them the most troubling kind of issues they have to deal with on the streets, the issue of self-regard and identity uh, is one of the more salient, uh, salient issues. Uh, so one of the things I'm, I'm working on uh, is developing a, a piece that, that challenges or at least forces us to reconsider Maslow's uh, famous hierarchy of uh, of needs. Another uh, finding coming from the comparative uh, cross-national research on homelessness uh, is that survival on the streets, or being, let's say being homeless, uh, has a leveling effect on cultural differences. I mean, here you have four cities uh, in four different continents, four different cultures, uh, 
four different languages, but yet when it comes to characterizing life on the street, uh, there's a certain continuity across the four cities, which, which raises interesting questions about the, the depths of cultural constraints uh, when it comes to certain base survival kinds of needs and contingencies. Well, I, you know, I think our hope is all of our research makes a difference, but I think this one has. I know that uh, uh, some agencies working uh, with the homeless throughout the country have found uh, the book that Leon and Anderson and I wrote uh, called Down on Their Luck, A Study of Homeless Street People, uh, to be a useful kind of handbook uh, in uh, understanding and developing uh, agency policy with respect to the homeless. Uh, I think it's also had some influence uh, more generally. Uh, there, there's often a tendency to think of groups like the homeless in kind of uh, uniform stereotypic fashion. Uh, but uh, what our research suggests, among other things, is that there's a certain danger in that if you're going to actually work with them and help them get off the streets. And so what we kind of saw is that there's uh, kind of a three-tier categorization of homelessness. There are those who are recently homeless or dislocated, and then those who have kind of the chronically homeless, who have been on the streets for maybe a year or two years, for two years or more, and then those kind of in between who are in a liminal position. And I say a liminal position in the sense that they kind of vacillate between the life as we know it, uh, having a domestic residence and being on the streets. So if you're developing programs to help the homeless, you can almost think, approach it in a triage fashion. So that the most, the, the recently dislocated, those who've been on the streets for a relatively short time, or those if you get to them right away, are easiest to kind of get off the streets because they haven't become fully adaptive behaviorally or cognitively to life on the streets. For those in the middle, they kind of vacillating back and forth. For those at the, at, who are chronically homeless, it takes much more effort and more resources to help them off the streets. So, you know, if a community, a country, uh, has minimal resources to deal with this kind of problem, one way to approach it is in this triage, uh, triage fashion. Well, I, I mentioned uh, the, some of the findings, I think, that are with, of importance with respect to the homeless. Of course, when you ask the question about what's important, important to whom, uh, it can be important to uh, our colleagues in the particular area that we work in, uh, in the social sciences. Uh, it can be importance of, uh, to uh, members of the community who work with a particular group you're studying, or it can be of some relevance to students and to the larger community. Again, hopefully, it's of relevance to all of these. I think certainly some of my research on homelessness has had, had been of some relevance to these three different constituencies. And as for the work on social movements, I think that's been primarily, but of, of pretty significant relevance to other colleagues who study social movements, both nationally and internationally.